Today on Uncut with Lucia, we have Delenda McNair. Delenda is the author of two very inspirational books, and she's here to talk about her story, her books, of course, and many other things. So Delinda, welcome to Uncut with Lucia. Thank you so much, Lucia. So great to be here. It's my pleasure to have you here, Delinda. So now you are in North Carolina, yes? Yes. And you've been living there for since you were a kid or you just uh, like moved there. Tell us a little bit about you. Okay. Um, let's see. I was born and raised in North Carolina. However, around 89, I went to Georgia, Georgia for a spell, um, came back to North Carolina for a spell, and then went to um, travel and tourism school in Kissimmee, Florida. For um, It was a four-month program. And from there, I went on to training. I ended up working for a um, flagship airlines. So from there, I went to training in um, Euless, Texas. From training, I went directly to my report base for the airlines, which was Miami, Florida. Um, I lived there for like a year and two or three months. And from then, I from there, I moved to Nashville, Tennessee for about uh, until about 1999, I think it was. Um, so I did two years of flight attendant. I did two years as a travel agent. And when I came back to North Carolina in 1999, I started um, in insurance property and casualty insurance. So my career history is kind of all over the place, customer service, <laughs> insurance, travel and tourism, and now writing. And um, I get to get, be my mother's caregiver. So I started off in North Carolina, went to a couple of other different states, and now I am back in North Carolina. Well, you've been doing, you've been doing so many hats. <laughs> You're right. I, I, I had a, a few hats that I had the opportunity to wear during that time period. You're right. And being an author or being a writer, it was a dream or it's just you decide to start writing? Last oh, year. wow. Um, it was OK. So <laughs> I was about to say it was kind of a dream, but not that it was my dream to be a writer or author. Um, at this time, I was a flight attendant living in Miami, and I had a conversation with my younger sister. And for whatever reason, that conversation continued in my head as a dream that night. So, you know, so that's the dream part when I said kind of a dream. So in my mind, that was it. Didn't think no more of it. But I kept having that repeat dream after that conversation to the point that I was like, let me talk to her about this dream. So I talked to my sister about the dream. and. That was it. But the next night it picked up from that dream that I had before. So it was like it was continuing. And that's when I learned. Well, let me say this. That's when I became more aware and connected to my creative side, because we all have a creative side. I was about to say that's when I learned I had a creative side. But no, we all have a creative side. Most of us are just not in tune to it and are not paying attention to it. And at that time, I was not. <laughs> paying attention to mine. So for my creative side, I learned that it's three parts for me. I see it, I say it, and I do it. So I was seeing it in my dreams. I was talking about it with my sister, and then I was writing it out, like whenever, after a dream. And sometimes I was having these thoughts while I was on my flight. So I was having napkins, whatever I could turn over. At one time, my passenger saw me. He was like, here, take this notepad because I was writing on this napkin and <laughs> making it work. <laughs> so, yeah. So I was seeing it in my dreams. I was talking about it to my sister. And eventually I was getting to a point where I could make the notes and I was writing it down. And each time I went through that process, again, the storyline kept growing. So these storylines are so deeply God-given. So it started off partially as a dream, but then it all ultimately became me being obedient because I had no idea, no thought of writing. Um, at that time, again, I was a flight attendant living in Miami. So all I'm trying to do is see the world. That's all I want to do. I want to travel. I want to see the world, talk to different people. Never, I never even journaled. I didn't even journal. So... It was finally when I said, okay, God, if you dump it here, I'll do it. I'll write it. 
But in the beginning, I didn't even foresee it having my name in my picture because I'm such a behind the scenes person. So I didn't want my picture on anything. I didn't want my name out in public. So my sister, again, the busy one, the younger one, we were talking and she was asking me about my progress. And I was like, yes, this is where I am. This is what I've done so far. And she was excited for me. She was like, I'm so excited. I can't, I can't wait to see you on a panel. I could see you right now talking about the book. And I was like, um, that won't happen because it will not have my name and it will not have my picture. So she goes on and she was like, well, all I'm going to say is how dare you hide when God specifically gave the story to you? If he specifically gave the story to you, how can you put some fictitious name up there and not put a picture? So then I'm like, now I'm going to God having this conversation. I'm like, really, God, <laughs> does it have to have my picture? Does it have to have my name? Because the story is still the story. Like, it's going to read the same if it's going to connect to whoever it's going to connect to. You know what I'm saying? But I didn't feel comfortable with not putting my name and not putting my picture because of the way my sister said it. If he specifically gave the story to you, how dare you hide and not put your name in pictures? So henceforth, they do carry my name and carry my picture. So that's how the whole writing thing started. It was God, totally God inspired from a dream. And I finally said, okay, God, I'm listening. And the writings begin, like the, the, the notes and stuff that I start taking and, and jotting down for the books began in 1995. And it, I was struggling because, again, I was so behind the scenes. I didn't really want to be out here. And um, the first publication for the book Father, Then the Eyes Can See, a book about redemption, forgiveness, and love, the love of man, the love of God, um, that's, that book was published in 2013. And then the follow-up book, You Taught Me, was um, published in 2019. Actually, that was my birthday gift to me that year. Um, it was published, it was completed and published one day before my birthday. My birthday is June 22nd. And it, I was able to get it done and deliver it to me for my birthday <laughs> on June 21st in 2019. And I have 10 other titles. However, right now I have writings for the third and the fourth book. Wow, you've been writing a lot. <laughs> so, <laughs> and... I saw that your book, you taught me, talks about forgiveness, like family, faith, and some of these very important themes. And what about your second book, uh, Father Than the Eyes Can See? Can you tell us a little bit about this book? Yes, actually, Father Then the Eyes Can See was the first publication. And what happened with that book is I thought uh, I was so green. There was so much that I did not know. And in my mind at the time, I just could not fathom one book containing everything because it was so much information. And for those, the readers that do get the opportunity to read Father Than the Eyes Can See, of course, that's the first one. And You Taught Me is a follow-up. So you, will, you want to start with Father, because if you start with You Taught Me, you're not going to understand what's going on. It's going to sound chaotic. Father Than the Eyes Can See is the first title. And such is life. It starts off hitting with punches, and it's a little chaotic because there's so much going on. but I didn't even, the thing is with Father Than the Eyes Can See, when I said, find God, if you put it here, I'll write it. I did not even realize at the time how much of, of a residue of me was in those, in that, right, in those writings. I, did, I didn't see it because I wasn't reading it as a reader picks up an author's book and take on this journey of the book. I was simply executing and being obedient and writing I wasn't even really connecting completely to what I was writing. And someone came across that book and was talking to me about that book. And they were asking me some questions. 
And it dawned on them, and forgive me because I hear the grounds out there now, they're more in the lawn. So if you hear the, more, the lawn more, I'm sorry. <laughs> the grounds, people out there taking care of our grounds. But um, she asked me a question and the way I answered the question, she said, stop, wait a minute. She said, have you read your book? And I was like, no. I, I said, as far as me picking up the book and reading it as a reader and going along for the journey, no, I have not. She said, you need to read your book because you don't even know what you wrote. Wow. And I was like, and then in my mind, I'm thinking, well, how could I not know what I wrote? I wrote it. But when I started reading it, I was like, wow, that's so true. She's right. Because I'm reading. I was like, oh, my God, that's me. Like, it's, it's, it was like, <laughs> that, that's familiar. Oh, like that is so it's like different parts. It was making my heart jump as I'm reading along the storyline, because I could go back to those very moments in time when I was living out those things. So in Father Than the Eyes Can See, it is a fiction book. However, it is, I didn't even realize that when God was giving it to me, it was residue of my life that either I had already gone through or was about to go through. For instance, my mother came to live with me because she came to visit in the last weekend of April, 2012, she got sick. She wasn't feeling good that Friday, that last Friday of April. So my mother went through the whole weekend, the Friday, the Saturday into late, early, like midnight Sunday morning. Um, she went, she was having these, her body was going through changes and my mother did not directly tell us, you know what? I'm not feeling that well. Let's go check it out. She would tell my younger sister one thing, my older sister who was in Kansas, she got her on the phone telling her one thing. Granted, she's here in my house with me. She tells me something. So finally, she says to me, um, just out of general, just a passing comment, she said, how do you know when you're having a stroke? What are some of the symptoms? But she looked fine. I'm looking at her. She's talking to me. She's standing there. I'm totally missed that she thought she was having stroke-like symptoms. I thought she was just talking because of a, something a friend went through. Come to find out by that late that evening, my mother was sitting there writing and she was dragging her arm. And I'm like, did you just drag your arm? What's going on? That's when the whole story came out to me about what she had been going through the whole weekend, the whole weekend. And we live right here by a hospital. She, we had gone out from eight o'clock that morning to 10 o'clock that night. We were in and out. My mom on my heels, keeping up, never said anything about feeling a little sluggish in her body. And we done passed, I don't know how many emergency rooms, how many urgent cares, how many, you know, we've passed so many different things that we could have checked her out. My mother walked herself into that emergency room and never walked out. Like she, she lived through it, but we rolled her out in a wheelchair because she was having many strokes. And we didn't know because she didn't directly tell us of the, all the things that she was, she would tell pieces. So going back to the book, in the book, again, these writings began in 1995. My mother's stroke happened in 2012. That's I'm writing about a stroke situation. <laughs> I, had no, I had never experienced somebody directly that I got the opportunity to see a stroke situation with. I'm writing about this man, and I'll give this part. In the book, Father Than the Eyes Can See, it is a single father raising his son because his wife died early on. And his son, is, he, his, he had a stellar son. He was just like doing what he could to take care of his father. And um, then he was geared to go off to college. Well, the last weekend, his, the last weekend, listen to this, the last weekend, <laughs> the last weekend before he's geared to go to college, his son, his father walks to the mailbox to get the um, mail, but doesn't walk back to the house. Some, he fought, he collapsed. And a runner in the neighborhood passes him and see him, stops, come back and call 911. So his father has a stroke. Now, his father's stroke in the book, in the writings, again, these are the characters, his father's stroke in the book is not as severe as what happens to my mother. It temporarily affected his eyesight, and I'll tell you this part, and eventually his eyesight does return, but his son doesn't know that. All his son sees is his father broken, and in his mind, he can't go to college now. So he alters his life. And that all unfolds in the story of Father Than the Eyes Can See. But again, those writings began in 1995. That book was off in my publisher's hand by, I think, by May or March of 2012. And it didn't complete until December of 2012. 
and it was published, released completely because we went back and forth. They had this, some updates. All of that was done and it was released in, I think it was October of 2012. But I did not realize I was writing partial pieces of my mother's stroke situation or because I, I get to be her caregiver. So I didn't realize I was writing about that caregiver story because the son was somewhat of a caregiver there. I had no idea that was my story. So that's what I mean. Like when I say, when I, when I could see the writings there, knowing when they began and how some of the things unfolded truly in my life, it, it was like, whoa, that's, that was, that's me. Like, that's so me. So those writings, totally and completely God inspired based off a smidget of a conversation that I had with my younger sister, some residue of reality, but mostly just me being obedient and, and just sitting to the computer and, or taking a pen to a pad and flowing and whatever he was dumping, I was simply releasing. Okay. So it talks, yeah, it talks about forgiveness, redemption, love, um, the love of man and the love of God. And for those who believe and, and God, you know, Christ, some of us, you know how it tells us in the Bible to seek ye first the kingdom of God. Of course, we say that, but most of the time we, okay, I won't even talk about we, let me talk about me. <laughs> I say that, but there are so many times when it seemed to that to me that, oh, it's simple, cut and dry. I got this. I didn't go seek God because I thought I had it, regardless of how big it was or how small it was. But that's how we do him sometimes. Like we want to love on man before we love on him. You know, we want to take a, a, a situation to man before we take it to God. And that's why the little subtitle in the book is that way. A book about redemption, forgiveness, and love, the love of man, the love of God, because sometimes that's how we do him. We love him last, but he's always there. And so it takes you on that journey of the forgiveness part where someone makes a hugely like, I cannot believe that person did that. Like, there is no forgiveness for that. But then when you realize, as you read along the journey, even though you don't completely understand her why, when you read her journey, you get how she could got into that place to think that she could do something like that. But even, her, even she does that thing and realize instantly, like, wait a minute, like, I can't do that. But when she realized it, there's no going back to erasing it because it's already the dominoes are, has dropped and they're going, taking the effect. And now the dominoes are rolling around and she's trying to figure out how to double back. And that's most of the storyline and how it affects four other families, including herself in this book. Linda, this was a very unique situation that you had. I've never heard about this before. Do you believe in miracles? Absolutely. Um, wow. <laughs> Here's the thing. I had a car accident and, um, oh, well, let me back up. Okay. So my father died. I was living in Nashville and that's what helped me leave the flight attendant career because I was never home for father's day or mother's day. I was never home for any of my parents or my family's major, like, um, anniversaries, my parents' anniversaries, um, birthdays, um, Christmas, Thanksgiving. Those are major holidays. So at that time, I was just beginning my career as a flight attendant. So of course, where do you think the senior flight attendants are? <laughs> Most of them want to be with their family, their grandchildren, and you know, things like that. So I was always either on a plane or in a hotel somewhere alone. And when I say alone, I'm not saying, oh my God, I'm all alone, but it, oh, not with my family is what I'm saying. Um, so I sacrificed that family time to get to wear my wings as a flight attendant. Um, but I didn't get it until my father got sick one time and I was on a trip and I called, I, I made it to that trip in Orlando. And when I went back to Miami that morning, I let them know, I'm like, listen, my, uh, my father's sick. I'm going to make, I'm going to work the trip back to my uh, Miami tomorrow morning. But from there, I need you to get someone to cover the rest of this trip. And um, I flew home. I saw my father. Now, at that time, I think that time was like May, could have been May, I think it was about May. And um, at that particular time, when my father was in the hospital, they had given him a certain amount of time to live. Now, I didn't know that. We leave him, 
He tells me he loves me like he always does. But I didn't realize until after the fact that he said it differently that time. Like I didn't hear it that time in that moment. But after he died, I heard him differently. I heard how he said it and he said it differently. That's because they knew he had been given X amount of time to live, but he only lived three months of that time. Like I didn't even realize my father was that sick. I knew his health was not the best, but I did not get that it was, yo, this is life or death. I didn't get it. I didn't, I didn't see that when I saw him. I didn't hear that when he talked to me because I talked to him every week. So, um, miracles. Absolutely. Um, the day before my father died, he and my mother had went to a follow-up appointment and my mom was like five feet. My, my dad was like six, two. <laughs> so he looks down at her and he says, you know, a lot of people are going to miss this old boy when I'm gone. And she was like, oh, Joyce, don't say that. Don't talk like that. That was Tuesday. My father died one o'clock in the morning that Wednesday. And that Tuesday, because I always call him every Wednesday. That Tuesday, I was on a dealer trade with a friend. I used to drive cars, do dealer trades too. <laughs> so we was on a dealer trade. And um, I kept saying, let me see your phone. Let me see your phone. And I grabbed his cell phone to call my father. And I was like, wait a minute, what's today? It's, I said, no, I always call him Wednesday. So when you talk about miracles, God tried to give me that last conversation. But I didn't, I even dialed the number and then hung up like, that's right. I call him every Wednesday. No, I didn't listen. He was trying to give me that last conversation because, of course, God knew I'm taking him. These are your final hours. It was 10 times. I remember it. I remember it like it's today and I'm walking through it now. It was 10 times I picked up that phone. I asked my friend for the phone. I had the phone in my hand, dialed my parents' number, and I did not complete that call. And the next call I got was my younger sister at one o'clock that morning saying, sit down. And I'm like, what? She was like, I need to tell you something. Are you sitting down? I was like, no, just go ahead and tell me. <clears throat> and she told me, and then it dropped me. So I was like, wait a minute, what? And then my mind, I'm like, no, because I call him every Wednesday. I, I got to call him. <laughs> and she was like, no. So she's telling me what happened. And I'm like, okay. So yes, I definitely be believe in miracles. It's just that some of us are not always open to them. So we miss them. Some of us are not always paying attention and we don't get it until after the fact, like me. So I missed it. Um, but I had a car accident. My father died 12 days before his 56th birthday. <clears throat> that was in July. His birthday would have been August 11th. I had a car accident <clears throat> going to work January 6th of 1997. Um, talk about miracles. We in work traffic. I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs> I am on 40. And the what crazy thing is, we, it was the same weather that we had had the day before. And we had just traveled that same exit multiple times. I'm on it that morning. I hit ice. There's no coming back from that. And I knew enough to pray like, okay, God, I put it in your hands. You take control because I can't, there's nothing I can do here. I went out. I said, because I, you know how you look in the mirror, rear view mirror and you gauge and where you can plug into traffic. That's all I remember. I, I had looked in the rearview mirror. I saw the three lanes of traffic and I saw which pocket where I could pop, get in as I merged off into traffic. But I hit the ice and I felt no control in the wheel. I literally took my hands off the wheel. I prayed. And the next thing I knew, I was on the other side of the, um, the bank of the road and someone was calling out to me, ma'am, are you okay? Like he took me out doing, I, so, and my car rode. I was driving a, a blazer. I was driving a, what was it, a, a 99 Blazer. And it, it went over, flipped on the driver's side and skid. It flipped on the top of the vehicle and skid. And it, and it flipped and hit the driver on the passenger side and skid. And when it landed, it landed on the top of the vehicle and the nose was down. And it, so it skid like that. And someone stopped and helped me out the vehicle. And I, I, I don't remember seeing any of the, all the motion of it. I just remember when I looked for traffic, couldn't get in. And then I, someone was like, ma'am, are you okay? So talk about miracles. Yeah, because the top of my vehicle was crushed down. So this is the top of the seat where your head rests. The, v, the, the top was down here. And so to look at my vehicle, I shouldn't have been here. 
And that was just six months after they had buried my father. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, as you said, sometimes we don't see the signs. Yeah, we are not like our eyes are not open to some stuff. Right, right. And your book talks about forgiveness. And this is a very controversial theme. Some people say, but I can't forgive. I'm not God to forgive. And I would like to know your opinion. Why are people resistant to forgiveness or to forgive other people? I would say for me, I would say for me. On the title of, or no, in the write-up, on the back of Father Than the Eyes Could See, one of the questions that I ask is, is there, and I, I should know this by heart, it's horrible, but it's, it says something to the degree, to the fact of, is there a task, a thing or an act that's just so hurtful and it's just simply beyond forgiveness? Is, is, is there such a thing that someone can do to you, that someone can say to you that truly is beyond forgiveness and it, it omits you from needing to or having to forgive? And that's when it goes on to say, take, read along the journey and find out. Because of the thing that Angie does, it really is, for, <laughs> the act of it makes it seem that it, it is unforgivable. Because basically, in a sense, she steals the life of four people for about five years. And they are all within pretty much breathing space of each other and don't realize that they are. And she knows it all. She sees it and she sees them. Well, she see two of them on a daily basis, including herself, because it affects her life too. So the forgiveness matters because we sometimes miss that. And, and let me say this. I am not trying to say this to minimize one's hurt, one's pain, one's disappointment. I don't know where that individual goes or I don't know where that ought, that thing ushers that person to because of other things that may have happened, you know? Um, but the thing is at the end of the day, I think we, most of us has heard it before, it's choosing not to forgive is like um, giving poison to someone else. And how is it? It's like eating, to eating the poison but expecting it to hurt someone else. You ate the poison. So how's it going to affect the other person? No, it's going to slowly kill you or immediately kill you, depending on what the poison was. So such the same as a parallel with forgiveness. When you choose, because that's what you're doing, when you choose not to forgive, you are choosing to steal elements of your own life and the betterment of your own life. You are choosing to open up your body to to, to, to sickness because it, it opens up doors for stress. It opened up doors for disappointment. It opened up doors for you doing this looping in a conversation with yourself. So it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation of how that person should or should not have done that or how you can't believe that person thought it was okay to do this or not do this. And so it's, it's you, but each time you visit that conversation, is killing the life out of you because that's focus and attention that you could have been somewhere actively bettering your life. So you're, you're taking away the healing gift that is given to both you and that person. So that's why, because it's a stealer, it steals. Unforgiveness steals, unforgiveness hurts along the same lines as the act that took place that, that requires forgiveness. Now, I'm not saying it's the, the same because again, the acts vary, but it's still at the end of the day, it takes away from your betterment. The thing that happened, it takes away from the betterment of your relationship or what the relationship that could have been, or if you were building something together, be it professional or personal, it takes away from that. And it takes away from you being a full, healthy body and being when you choose to sit on that eye and nurse that eye or that thing 
opposed to simply saying, you know what, first of all, addressing, being real with yourself and addressing your, um, what's the, the role that you played in it. Now, granted, yeah, there are some things that take place that it was totally out of your hands. You were just being the willing, nice friend or the willing partner in the business doing things the right way. And this person always had an undermined attention, uh, um, intention. You, yeah. But at the same point in time, you chose to be in partnership with that person because dot, dot, dot. So release yourself for whatever you missed about that person that allow you to sign on for that, that partnership and pick up and move on. So there's always something about that thing that even though it may have ended up in a bad way or not as good as you wanted it to, there was something about that whole situation to that point that allowed you to see something or to learn something about you and about people. So that is a benefit because now you do not have to be on repeat with those things again. So it's a choice to forgive and it's a healing gift when you choose to forgive and not only to forgive others, to forgive yourself, because I found when I was reading through the book, um, it made me think about a situation. And I was like, wow, did you ever forgive yourself for that? Because I, I talk about the disappointment from it often, or I think about it, like, what were you thinking? Like, man, you should have dot, 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 dot. But if I can come back at qu as quickly and say, what were you thinking you should have? That, that reminds me, I'm not going to say it tells you, but that reminds me, wait a minute, did you truly forgive yourself for that? Because otherwise, why are you still here saying, oh my God, I was sitting here thinking, man, do you know when I was X amount of years old? Or do you know when I lived here, man, I had the opportunity to, I should have, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, so it's a gift. It's a healing gift. You deserve it to give it to yourself. And even though the person that positioned you to, to be at this place may not deserve it, but you deserve it to give it to them so you can put a closure on that chapter and keep it moving. You may not forget the thing, but you do not have to keep revisiting the pain of the thing. And that's what forgiveness helps you do. It helps you to close the door and close the chapter of the pain of that thing. Oh, it was beautifully said. And Thank I you. I agree 100% with you. And I was thinking about forgiving yourself. I think it's more difficult we forgive ourselves than forgiving others. Yes, be right. But well, one of the things is because it's a given. As long as you live, you're going to get to lay eyes on yourself every morning in that mirror when you brush your teeth and wash your face. And you never know when it's going to hit you about that thing. Like, do you really think whatever, <laughs> dot, 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 fill in the blank, you know what I'm saying? Or you could be simply getting dressed, not even looking at yourself and something about the color or something about that, that item of clothing. It triggers you and make you go and it puts you right back. And you're like, and you go through that emotion all over again. I'm telling you, I've been there. I've done that. Um, that's why I've learned that it made me ask myself, like, wait a minute. Did you really forgive yourself about that? So, yes, you are absolutely right. You're dead on with that one. And, yeah, and Delinda... I believe also that unforgiveness can cause anger because you keep that feeling inside and keeping anger inside, in my opinion, can cause you to be sick. So that's why many people start having stomach problems like stomach ache, like gastritis and reflux, acceptance, reflux, because they keep the anger inside. Absolutely. Yes, it is a recipe for sickness for you. It is. And your because your body internalizes it. So we never know whether it's a happy thing or a not so happy thing. Your body, your emotions, it releases energies and, and, and uh, what you call it. Um, I don't have the proper word right now, but it, it releases things inside. And it's going to have a good or not so good effect on the things inside of you, your organs, your body parts. And depending on what it is and where it relates to, that's how it's going to land and that's what it's going to affect. So you're right. 
So if you keep repetitively this thing and that thing and that thing, and now this person has, the, now here this person goes, now here this thing goes. Yes, your body, no, it can't handle that. It doesn't deserve that. And you don't deserve that. Your mind and your emotions don't deserve to repetitively keep revisiting this one-sided conversation again, because you're not with that person who did it for the most part when you go in there in your mind's eye. You're not talking to that person. You're not even hashing it out. You're playing it over and over again, one-sidedly of how it landed on you and how it affected you, what it changed for you and to you in your world. And Delenda, what do you hope your readers take away from these books? I pray that my readers take away from this book that one, they are worth self-forgiveness, regardless of regardless of what the I is, because they could actually be the one on the side of that big forgive that thing that seems to be unforgivable. And if that is the case, first and foremost, address it, observe it, assess the situation, the it of it. And you could do this quietly. You could do it quietly or simply write it out. I would suggest that you don't verbally say the negative thing because you know how, I, the way I see it is, I choose to verbalize those things that I choose to see come to pass. <laughs> so I do not want to give life to thoughts that are not going to be helpful, productive, and beneficial. Now, am I on the mark about that all the time? No, but I'm mindful of it. So if I'm going to release words into the atmosphere, and now they have weight, and I've given it life, I'm choosing to do, I'm mindful that I want it to be that, that I actually want to see come to pass. So when you are addressing yourself about a situation or something that you did that wasn't the best of a decision, write it out. And then just as you would have a child or a friend come to you and, and you say, okay, when this happened, you could have done this. Well, yeah, you're right. You shouldn't have done this or you shouldn't have said this, but go apologize. So the same um, um, what you call, encouragement, I guess I could say, that you would give to that friend now that you write that now that you have written out that situation. Now this conversation can be open between you. But again, it's in writing. So it's a written letter. It's an open it's an open heart letter to yourself. And so now you start encouraging yourself. Look at that thing, the, the, the decision or the person that you entertain, the decision you made, the thing that you did, review it and encourage yourself and nurture yourself on how you could have done it differently, what you wish you had done differently. And now that you see the results of it, how you can now begin to nurture yourself from it and forgive yourself of it. This is so important. Burn it, trash it, and let it go. And now you can close your, you can close the chapter on the act of the thing or the thing, the action of the thing, and now simply deal with nurturing you to betterment from that thing. Yeah, you're completely right. And Linda, are you planning to write more books? Absolutely, yes, I am. Um, again, I have, and I'm granted my. My writing is not as consistent now because um, I'm learning to balance it all with being a caregiver for my mother. And there are some nights my mother does not have the best night's sleep. And of course, if she's not sleeping, her little doggy, because she came with a dog too, <laughs> her little doggy and I, we are both like, you know, we're not comfortable because she's not comfortable. So, but right now I have about 50 pages for the third and the fourth book. So it's just a matter of me having the time I won't say finding because we all have 24 hours in a day <laughs> but me having the balanced time to sit there and productively give in those writings the way I gave in those first two writings so that's my struggle right now yeah and being a full-time caregiver to your mom I'm pretty sure you learned a lot of new things absolutely because again as we, you and I were talking before we started recording um I was a flight attendant you know I I was so solo behind the scenes um I I do not I like I never got married 
Um, I do not have children, so I never gave birth. So that innate thing that a mother would get about taking care and nurturing, I, I had to learn all of that. Um, getting used to someone being in my space and having a need of me and from me, I had to learn to be comfortable with that because I had, I'm going to be honest with you. I had some severe elements of selfishness, <laughs> like, because it was, it was just me in my house. Um, I didn't, I didn't even have an animal. Like I said, she came, my mother and her dog. So now I get to go get up in the middle of the morning or in the middle of the night or whenever she's barking to go check on her and take her out for a walk. Yeah. Things. And in my particular County, this is a pooper scooper County. So guess what? I get to go behind her with a bag. And, Come on, man. Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> like that was not my plan. <laughs> so yes, it has actually, it has absolutely taught me a lot about servitude and to simply, and it's funny that I was listening to an uh, old recording of Dr. Miles Monroe, and he was talking about marriage. Yes, I'm not married, but I was listening to it because one of the things that he said is what true love is, is to figure out the ways that that person needs and wants you to love them before they show you or tell you. And to love someone um, regardless of if they reciprocated the way that you want them to back. That's what true love is. It's to continually give, not expecting anything back. And with me, so I was listening to it because it was interesting to me. My mother loves me. I know she loves me. And she tells me that she loves me. But as far as like physically and actively doing things for me, she's immobile to that degree. So I was like, wow, I'm seeing that. Now, granted, it's a totally different relationship than a marriage relationship. I get that. But I hadn't even fathomed that idea of that because in my mind, like he said, it's about give and take. We all expect it to be, if we come to this agreement or this relationship, it's going to be some level of give and take. Well, everybody's given is not the same given. So for you, it may be a given to you. Yeah, I'm going to always get to make sure he has coffee on the table and his breakfast on the table. Well, that may not be his given for you, but you may like that, you know? So it, it gave me an opportunity to, to hear some different dynamics of just relationship and loveship period that I never thought about. Because again, I spent most of my life as a single and it was totally if I wanted to be in someone else's space or not, or when I wanted to be in someone else's space or not. I, so it, 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 when my mother came to live here, it always, I always got, I always get to be in a position to have the pet of giving and, and paying attention, like anticipating her needs, because again, I could just get up and go to the restroom. My mother doesn't. I get to take her to the restroom. You know, I could just get up out the bed. My mother doesn't. I get to assist her out the bed. So yes, that, that, even though he was talking about the marriage relationship, I learned a lot from that um, recording because it's all about giving without expecting anything back and to give it lovingly, compassionately, and not, and not grudgingly to make that other person feel like they are a um, burden. Cause my mother would never feel like a burden in my house. I don't care how bad my back may be hurting sometimes cause sometimes it does <laughs> because I didn't go to training for this to be a caregiver and how to properly live her. So yeah, but my mother would never, I would never put those weights on my shoulder because she never put those weights on my shoulder when she raised me as a child. And I have no idea what she went through. <laughs> raising me up to an 18 year old before I left home. Exactly. It's a difficult situation because having a stroke, I think maybe she feels like that is, she needs you for everything. But if you give love, I think she feels that she is important and she, at least she can feel relieved because we have to see put ourselves in their shoes absolutely because i told my mother in the beginning when she had her stroke in 2012 and came here she came here june of 2012 and her her language was off because what the way they explained it to us was her brain is firing like normal 
but it is the delay and an obstacle in the delivery to her tongue and her mouth to speak. So her brain knows that it told, it told the mouth and tongue to say, give me something to drink or can I get something to drink? But when she delivers it, it doesn't come out that way. So she, knowing that her brain, her, having her brain know that what it told it to say and for her to hear it, she was getting frustrated in the beginning. She was like, I can't, I can't say it. I can't talk. And I was like, no, hold on. Yes, you can. I said, here's the deal. I said, your brain is on point. It's doing what it's supposed to do. It's sending the message it's supposed to do. I said, think about it this way. I said, have you ever been driving and you see detour? And you're like, well, wait a minute. I always go this way. But you see the orange sign say detour. And you don't know why there's a detour. It could be that they're working on the road. It could be that it's a horrible accident. Or it could be that the road is flooded. And it could be any gamut of things. The sign doesn't tell you why you're detouring. It just simply says detour. So you're like, okay, you adjust and you go and you follow the signs. But eventually, guess what? You make it to the roundabout to that point where you were going. So here's the deal. I need you to keep talking. I said, we're going to put it together and we're going to figure out what you're saying. I said, because now it's almost like you're learning to connect your brain with your tongue and your lip again. So just keep talking. We'll figure it out. So she got to that point where she kept talking. And then eventually, yeah, the brain the firing of the brain and the delivery of the tongue in her mouth was delivered. Yes, it met. So, and I was telling her, I was like, I'm gonna tell you this. I said, mama, I said, this is new to me because we, we had some hard times in the beginning that I just was like, come on, man. Like, like, come on, Lord, really? Like, I don't, this, this, I don't know this stuff. And so there were times that I had to excuse myself from my mother because again, these are my challenges and my learning curve, not hers she had her own learning curve. This is someone who would get up and leave at five o'clock in the morning and beat me out the house and then still be gone when I got home from work when she would come to visit. Like she's a, she likes to go out and about. This is a woman who would call, she had, a, my mom still was old school. So she had a phone book, an address book when she would go through and call friends and family every morning. If it was just to say, good morning, have a good day. I was thinking about you. I love you. I'll talk to you later. Like, and people tell us now, I miss your mom, man. She used to call me every morning. I miss your mom. She used to do this, this, this. I miss your mom. She used to drop by just to say hi. Like, so, so, we're still getting that. So I told her, I said, listen, I said, I'm be honest with your mama. I said, this is hard for me because of stuff I just don't know. I said, but it's hard for me. This is my shoulders, not yours. I said, it's not, you're not a burden. I said, but I'm struggling with learning what exactly what you need and how to give it to you. So I just need you to be patient with me. I said, so if you feel tension and thickness, it's not because of you. It's because I'm frustrated with me because I don't know it. And then she said, I love you. <laughs> and I'm about to cry now just thinking about it. <clears throat> so. I'm getting emotional. It's <laughs> like I'm trying not to cry. So. You can take your time. Oh. It was just very, very important to me that she knew without a shadow of a doubt that she is never a burden to me and that her voice always matters to me because it does. And I told her, I said, I would never take your voice. You know how some people assume that because someone's a wheelchair, well, you need me to do it for you and you get it when I get it and you just wait because I'm doing something. Mm -mm. I don't care. She, in the beginning when she said, I got to go to the bathroom and I'm like, mama, you just, I said, you know what? Okay. Um, and I could just get her off the bathroom, get her all cleaned up, sit her down and think I'm here to go do something else that we need to have done. And then she's like, I got to go to the bathroom. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then one time she got to the point that she didn't want to keep asking me. And it was important in the beginning for us to keep her hydrated. So we were like, um, I was like, mama, come on, I need you to get this drink down. I need you to drink. Then she was like, I don't want no more. And I was like, mom, we, we can't allow you to get dehydrated. Why won't you drink this? And then she finally said, because I had to go to the bathroom too much. I don't want to keep asking you to go to the bathroom. I said, no. 
I said, if you get dehydrated, that's going to have more issues that you're going to have to deal with. I said, mama, I don't care if time I bend my knees thinking I'm about to sit down. You say I got to go to the bathroom again. You tell me you got to go to the bathroom again because I'm going to get you to the bathroom. I'd rather take you to the bathroom if it's tw- every 20 seconds. And uh, if it means us keeping you from having to go back to the hospital because something else has happened to you. I said, remember, he told us you're right now, you are off with your temperament. So you could be too cold, too hot. We get to pay attention to that. Make sure you're not too cold. Make sure you're not too hot. Your, your temperament is also resonates your, your intake on your drinking. So we need to make sure you're hydrated because they taught us the little pinch test that you do on her skin. Um, so we were doing that in the beginning. And so, yeah. I was like, I would never, ever steal your voice. I, even if it's something I don't want to hear and I don't agree with, you still say it. I said, now, I may not respond the way you want me to, but <laughs> I'm going to give you the liberty to say what you need to say. So, yeah, like it was important to me for her never, ever to feel like she was a burden to me because I never felt like I was a burden to my parents. I never felt like I was a burden to my parents and she would never feel like a burden in my care. Never. Wow. You are so special. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well. Thank so, you. Delenda, where can we find you? And your book, of course, your books, of course. Okay. So you can connect with me on Facebook. On Facebook, it is author, comma, Delanda McNair. On Instagram, it is at Delanda McNair. And you can order the books from um, Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, pretty much anywhere, wherever your favorite bookstore is, you give my name, Delanda McNair, the book title, either Father Then the Eyes Can See or You Taught Me and the ISBN number that you can look up online. Um, and you can call your local bookstore, your favorite bookstore, and just request that they order the book. If you are interested in an autographed copy, contact me through the Facebook, um, author Delanda McNair, and um, we can talk about getting me getting your address and getting the uh, autographed copy to you. I do also have a website. I will be honest, it is not as updated as Facebook and Instagram, like with the pictures when I go out, out to different events and have the opportunity to um, deliver a hand deliver a book and I get to take a picture with those people, those, the, those readers, I get to take a picture with them and I post it. But the web address is um, www.delandamcnair.com. And um, I think that's it. Um, I think that's it. I, I, I'm, I do have a Twitter account too, but again, it is not as updated on um, the Twitter account. I think it is the LLC, which is truly his pen. Truly his pen is the Twitter account. So those are the ways that you can contact me. So oh, there are many ways to contact you. Yes. And I'm going to check out your book because I'm sure I have so many important things to learn. And Delenda, please come back when you have your third, fourth book because it was just uh, like an honor to speak with you here. Thank you so much. It was so, it was so sweet being here with you, Lucille. You're such a sweetheart. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>